Dear participants, dear friends, welcome to the seventh global digital encounter on IP in the post-COVID environment. Well, in this year 2020, we are not yet in the post-COVID environment, but we are still preparing it dynamically. <laughs> and as such, uh, uh, I am Laurent Manderieu, the uh, uh, director of the Transatlantic uh, IP Academy, and jointly with my colleague Emmanuel Desantes uh, from uh, uh, the University of Alicante and from the uh, FIDE Foundation, uh, we pulled our forces as TIPSA and FIDE to create this program of global digital encounters in order to create a think tank that reflects on the future of intellectual property and serves constituents that may be in the academy, in the academia, in uh, among professionals, among senior students, and all those interested in reflecting on the future of IP, how IP can be a tool for society and a positive one in whatever form. Uh, FIDE and uh, TIPSA uh, pull their forces for this so that we have a maximum worldwide impact. As many of you know, we have at each of our encounters uh, hundreds of participants. Sometimes we are close to 1,000 participants per encounter from all over the world and from all continents. Therefore, uh, we uh, follow the matter with different fields of interest. Uh, we also are lucky to have many uh, sponsors who disseminate all over uh, the world the information. They are on the website of uh, FIDE and we thank them for their support. Though we all do this work on a voluntary basis with uh, also uh, uh, Javier uh, fernandez Teschetti, who by chance will also be your moderator today, uh, will, uh, uh, the session's moderator, we pull our forces on a volunteer uh, basis so that uh, we really create a new type of family. A family that is with a faculty that also Professor DeSantis will describe at the end of the of this uh, the, of, the, of today's encounter, our 2020 faculty. We developed a project that is to uh, create a real legacy for the future because not only are these encounters, but professors and uh, participants who really honor us as being speakers are normally the really high flyers on their topic, give participants readings that can serve as a documentary basis for the, uh, for the event. So it's not only a one-shot uh, uh, online event, but there, are, there is a legacy. There are readings where you can find also documentary sources for your future. And also, we are proud to publish the Q&A, the chat, of course, anonymizing the question as per GDPR made, but giving also replies so that no reply, no question be left without any reply. With this introduction, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, two key academics in the field of trade secrets. Trade secrets are uh, a topic, are topics that are uh, studied in IP law that where there are a lot of misunderstandings but also a lot of major gains. There is no single doubt that the United States of America has developed a uh, leadership in this very field by having a uh, very um, important uh, jurisprudence and also recent legislation. The EU joined it in this uh, uh, in this very uh, challenging race. And as such, since two major uh, powers of the world are key players in trade secrets and represented, though in full academic capacity, by our two colleagues, uh, self-evidently, uh, trade secrets are uh, uh, becoming a worldwide topic, a topic that each government, professional, academic, law student must think about as soon as IP is concerned. I shouldn't keep the floor too long and would just wish to present our two uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, Sharon Sandin, who is Director 
of uh, the uh, IP center of Mitchell Hamline University and known worldwide as being one of the most authoritative uh, academic in the field of uh, trade secrets and IP in general. And as such, ladies first, it is really uh, uh, our pleasure to wel welcome you for the first time, but probably not for the last time, at these uh, Global Digital Encounters. Nicolas Bentin from my home country, France, is a professor at the University of Poitiers and also teaches all around the world intellectual property. His, uh, um, his writings and his book on intellectual property is known, including on trade secrets, is known all over the French speaking world and all over the world as being one of the most authoritative one. This is one of the uh, of the most uh, complete, accessible and yet in-depth manual in the field of intellectual property that I personally ever read. So as such, uh, uh, Professor Vantin, who uh, teaches trade secrets at Bocconi University uh, this year and uh, is with us and both our speakers are moderated by an exceptional man, uh, a real friend, as all uh, the colleagues who are in are today, uh, Javier Fernandez Laschetti, uh, who is a lawyer in Madrid and also an academic at the prestigious IE school in Madrid, at the IE University. And as such, uh, basically, uh, he has got a huge experience on trade secrets which made him as coordinator of the Global Encounters next to uh, Manuel DeSantis and myself, uh, made him the ideal person and the natural person to moderate this debate. I think I occupy the floor too much. Since I won't make the closing, this will be in the, digi in the Global Digital Encounter, my last appearance for the year 2020. So we keep for you a promising 2021. So it is also my occasion to present all my best wishes to friends connected all over the world to all of you. Uh, the, uh, and to meet you starting with the encounters in 2021, after we have had probably one of the most splendid encounters today, the one on trade secrets. Javier, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laurent, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, you have shown that uh, you are a real friend because you are saying uh, things that uh, just come from the from the mouth of a friend, and not so so. Tr not everything is true. I mean, and not so so important or so specialist as you 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 would like to to show me. In any event, I must say that that this is a a, a topic that I love a lot. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored by by being the the moderator in this uh, in this session. Uh, and uh, well, uh, but I, but I don't I never I will never forget that I'm just the moderator. I'm not uh, I'm not uh, uh, one of the speakers. So I'm no I will not be. I will try not to be uh, a, a, a coach and player at the same time. Okay. So and and yes, well, uh, the two professors were introduced, uh, and uh, they they both have a wider knowledge on on trade secrets as the topic for today. Uh, it's uh, true, and Laurent said that. Uh, uh, trade secrets were with us uh, for a long time. I mean, as, as part of our IP uh, studies and IP practice in in in, uh, in general. And uh, but it, it seems that uh, in, the, in the last times uh, they have uh, gained some uh, some uh, more interest uh, among the the, the community uh, of uh, IP lawyers, students, uh, professors, etc. And uh, probably will have a, an important role in the future that is that is coming. So uh, there are many, many things to discuss about uh, trade secrets, but we'll try to focus on two, three issues because uh, we will have more chances to, to talk about the about uh, about this. Uh, the first thing that I would like to to discuss with uh, with uh, with the two professors, with Sharon and and, and Nicola, is uh, what is uh, more or less the, the current landscape we we have uh, in uh, in the U.S. and uh, in uh, in uh, in Europe. Uh, Laurent has advanced a little bit. We have had some improvements uh, bo in both sides. Maybe the tradition of uh, the US is wider than, than in Europe, but uh, uh, the US has implemented um, some uh, federal uh, regulations that uh, are 
uh, complementing the, the tradition they had, the, the last one in 2016, the DTSA. And uh, in Europe, uh, we have had a process of uh, development and uh, enactment and then implementation of the uh, directive uh, of the European Union in 2016 that has been implemented in all the jurisdictions of, of Europe. So first of all, I would like to, uh, starting by Sharon, to introduce us to the current situation uh, and the current land landscape in, uh, in the US and in Europe. Uh, Sharon, please. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. I think the important point to make about the current landscape is that um, in uh, roughly 2010, there was a coordinated effort um, in the international legal community and among policymakers to increase uh, trade secret protection and harmonization worldwide. And one of the critical uh, examples of this is uh, I remember exactly the first time that a president, a US president, ever mentioned trade secrets in a State of the Union address, and that was by Barack Obama in, I think, around 2010. And this is when efforts started uh, to increase trade secret protection, both in the United States and uh, Europe, and those were coordinated efforts. It's no surprise that both the Defend, the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016 and the EU Trade Secrets Directive were adopted within weeks of each other um, I think that uh, both, it's important also to note that both of those um, laws, however, are based on um, U.S. law, known as the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Um, so that is really the model, and there's a lot of jurisprudence in the United States um, concerning the meaning of that act and all of its provisions. I don't think the Defend Trade Secrets Act is going to change much regarding that, um, but what I really look forward to is I think that certain features of the EU trade secret directive have the promise of really helping to illuminate some of the critical issues and some of the policy decisions that we uh, need to make with respect to trade secrets in the future. So I'll leave it there and, uh, and look forward to Nicholas. Yeah. Comment. Thank you. Yes, you have mentioned some some issues that we will will discuss a little bit more uh, in uh, afterwards. But uh, I would like to know the opinion of um, Nicolas about the, the situation landscape in 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 Europe, where we have uh, made a big improvement. I don't know if uh, it was if it was enough or not. Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you for this presentation. Uh, the, as you mentioned, in the European area, we have a, a, a EU directive which tried to harmonize the, the situation. Now the directive is implemented around the EU state, but I'm not sure that we have reached the goal. So it means uh, trade secret is really interesting because it's fact and law, and it is always difficult to create a combination between a factual situation. And we know that trade secret is the oldest uh, solution to be owner of uh, technology or to be owner of any kind of business secrecy. And, and we try to, to switch from a pure factual position to a legal qualification of this position, and it is really difficult. And uh, for the EU uh, area, the idea was to harmonize the unfair competition. It has been too difficult, so the Commission decided to uh, have a, an harmonization of the unfair practices, mainly through the consumer law. And then we built this uh, trade secret directive, and the trade secret directive had been uh, uh, implemented, but I think at the end of the day, the, 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 the level of harmonization is really limited because it has been implemented in our own uh, national uh, culture, legal culture, national law, and it was the same before. So how we are able to qualify a fact and to, uh, and to analyze in th through a legal approach the fact, uh, the, the situation is the same before the harmonization and after the harmonization. I can share with you an example between the, the German uh, civil law and the French civil law, or the Polish civil law and the Austrian civil law, because the problem is the same. In the German civil law, it's not possible to be owner of an incorporeal good, because inside the BGB, you need corporal thing. And in Austria or in France, in front of the uh, code civil, 
it is possible to be owner on uncorporal thing without any specific uh, legal regime as IP law. So it means in I am in Wien, it's possible to say that I am the owner of the trade secret. If I am in Warsaw or in Berlin, it's not possible to say I am the owner of the trade secret. It was like that before the harmonization. It is still like that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, maybe the, the US has a, has a more stabilized uh, situation because the road that they follow uh, coming from jurisprudence in the 18th century to the state law and then to the 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 um, uh, how do you call this this uh, the, the uniform uniform uh, laws the Low? uniform trade secrets act yeah, yeah that's the uniform trade secrets act and the economic espionage act to the the TSA so it's a long it's a long journey so it takes time don't you think so uh, and uh, maybe uh, something that, it, that that I would like to to ask you Sharon is uh, is there something that would change because of the DTSA uh, regarding the, the application before the courts? I mean, someone say that uh, it's moving from 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 state courts to 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 federal courts. Is that is that true? Uh, so the way uh, the DTSA is set up and under US law, um, it's it's uh, the federal courts do not have exclusive jurisdiction over the case uh, as they do, for instance, in patent and copyright cases. So that means technically that you could file a claim um, in either state or federal court under either state or federal law. And so most uh, plaintiffs in these cases are filing claims that allege both federal DTSA claims and state UTSA claims. But because uh, the federal courts now have jurisdiction, a larger percentage of those cases are being filed in federal court. I actually think the consequence of this is that federal judges tend to be more careful in applying the law. And uh, and so I think that defendants are going to be benefited greater because of the uptick in the filings in federal court. But what we're seeing in the first several years of implementation is that the courts are still relying primarily on state law and state jurisprudence. Um, there's some there's some differences um, that are important in federal court. For instance, you can only bring a claim if the trade secret is used in interstate commerce, which in theory would not cover all trade secrets. Um, and so that's um, one of the major changes. Another change is that uh, the federal law has a a, a civil seizure provision that's um, similar to an Anton Pillar uh, order, which is familiar in Europe. Mm -hmm. And okay. Sharon, if I may, uh, could, do you think that it will have an influence on worker uh, legal position? Because one of the main problems for trade secrets is uh, the, the worker freedom. And if uh, the, the worker freedom is covered by a state by state approach in the US, the, the federal level maybe is not so important for the implementation at the end of the day of the trade secret solution. Yeah, one of the most, you know, I was against, I'm on record of having been against the Defend Trade Secrets Act because I didn't think we needed it. I didn't think it added much. But one of the most controversial aspects of it and concerns was what was going to happen to all the state law um, concerning worker rights and the enforcement, for instance, of non-compete agreements and non-disclosure agreements. And there was a clause added to um, the legislation by proposed by Senator Dianne Feinstein, which is really allows uh, the state law to come into the consideration with, with respect to the issuing of an injunction. So uh, that law should come in and be respected. Um, but as you point out, the laws in the United States on that issue uh, differ uh, a lot um, from California, which basically outlaws non-compete agreements to other states, which seem to promote them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, not so far from the EU position because even with the trade secret directive and the implementation in the uh, different EU state members, we don't have an evolution of the uh, worker law in each e EU country. So it means 
maybe we are not so far from the your US solution. We know that the EU Commission want to have something as good as it is in the US, but with our discussion, we may see that the, 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 the difficulty which uh, raised in Europe are more or less the same in the US. Yeah, that's an issue and uh, it's it's very important, you know, because uh, it creates one of the more in, in, in practice it, it creates uh, one of the most important issues that is the difference between skill and knowledge and trade secrets that are acquired by the company. So that's a red thin line and uh, it's not uh, fully clear and uh, the non competition closest in, in, in Europe have us uh, have a different treatment. So uh, as, as it may happen with the US, as you mentioned California, for instance, it's not possible to have this. Yeah, one thing that I've written uh, extensively about in which I, th I want to stress here is that um, the evolution of trade secret law in the United States from its, its common law origins to the UTSA is, in my opinion, uh, a limitation on the scope of trade secret rights. Now, when the common story that is told about the Uniform Trade Secrets Act is it actually expanded trade secret rights by um, allowing trade secrets to be protected even if they're not used in a business. That's the common story. That story is wrong, in my opinion, and in, based on my research. And the reason why is that when we shifted from common law to the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, we expressly rejected the restatement first of torts uh, six factor test and instead adopted the three requirements of trade secrecy that are spelled out in the definition of trade secrecy of trade secrets. This then was incorporated into Article 39 two of the um, TRIPS agreement and was incorporated in the EU trade secret directive. And so I think it's very important to realize that although there's this uh, kind of harmonization and expansion of trade secret law worldwide or efforts to, to expand it. The scope of trade secret protection is really very narrow. Um, it doesn't protect any confidential information, but just certain confidential information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's also one of the issues. I mean, what's the limit? What, what is the confidential information? What is a trade secret? And uh, there could be some uh, some discussions about about this. Uh, Nicolas, sorry, I have, I have interrupted you. Yes, yes, uh, uh, the, the influence of the TRIPS agreement and the Article 39 is really important for all of us and I think it is the base of the uh, this uh, global approach or the global evolution of the uh, of the trade secret law around the world, but I think that the, the base of this article is not really good because the definition of trade secret is is not efficient. The the question of the the, the commercial value, for example, is just a kind of uh, an efficient solution because the value is not in the secret. The value is in the information, and because the information is important, I want to keep the information uh, by uh, uh, a secret, and secret. then I organize everything to have secret of my information. So the value is not in the secret. The secret is just the way to remain the holder of the uh, of the information, and I think. Uh, in this uh, approach, we are able to say that any kind of secret information has commercial value, and as you mentioned, is not the case. And 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 I think uh, the uh, second problem for us in the EU is that the the, the gap between the definition of know-how in block regulation and the definition of the trade secret in the EU trade secret directive. In the title of the EU directive, we mentioned know-how, but after inside the directive, we have nothing about uh, know-how. And so we can imagine for the EU legislator that trade secret and know-how is more or less the same thing. But in front of the EU regulation for uh, um, uh, for uh, TTA, for example, we have a very classical and specific definition of, of know-how and this legal definition of know-how is, is more strict than the definition of trade secret. So you mentioned that we have problem to be able to identify the limit between some commercial information and trade secret, but we also have difficulty to identify the, 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 the border between know-how, secret know-how and trade secret. And do we have to uh, develop some difference between those two notions. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 
I, 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 yeah, I want to jump in there because it's very, uh, you know, uh, first of all, for countries that are considering adopting a, uh, U, a DTSA, UTSA, EU trade secrets directive type law, I would highly encourage them if they don't want trade secret law to be over too expansive to look at the language of the uh, the commercial value or the economic value provision in the UT in US law instead of in the TRIPS agreement because in the TRIPS agreement it says commercial commercial value because it's secret in the uh, US law it's commercial value because it's secret but it has to be value to to others okay it has to have value to, to competitors and that limitation is very significant because it it prevents uh, protect trade secret protection for information which is of value to a company. Let's say, I uh, you know, information about the fact that they polluted a lake that they want to keep secret, but it's not of value to others in a commercial sense, right? And so I think that's an important limitation. U.S. jurisprudence has not really drawn that out, but my research into that language is that was the intent of it. It was to limit the scope of protection. And for a lot of political reasons, that wasn't built into Article 39 of TRIPS. The other point I'll make is the, confidential, the protection of confidential information. I think this was a flaw of the EU Trade Secrets Directive in that the it doesn't address all the pre-existing laws that have to do with protection of know-how and confidential information, which are not characterized as trade secrets. And in the U.S., we have a the, we have a provision that attempted to deal with it. That some courts apply it incorrectly, but the essence of it is, unless it's a trade secret, you can you can't protect that information under tort law. You might be able to protect it uh, or under equity. You might be able to protect it under contract law, but you can't protect it under tort law or equity. But in front of the EU solution, we didn't have harmonization based on uh, civil uh, tort law or something like that. So we have developed a specific solution for, for trade secret and it has been implemented for by each of us in our specific uh, civil or commercial law. So it is, uh, of course, uh, limited at the end of the day. But I think one of the points which is really important for the harmonization is court proceeding. And maybe it's the point which is the most complex, actually, to be in action, uh, to, to put in action in the EU area, because inside the EU directive, we have this a substantial definition of trade secret and which is the uh, uh, unlawful or lawful sources of the trade secret. But we also have a lot of position on uh, court proceeding for trade secret and to protect the trade secret in front of the court. And this point looks really difficult to put in action, not exactly for an academic point of view, but I think maybe Javier, as a, a practitioner, you have a lot of discussion with your uh, colleague or partner to know where it is possible to disclose some element in front of uh, any kind of uh, uh, commercial information or technical information. And we, we are able to see many conflicts between the classical solution of civil procedure, maybe some specific procedure for enforcement, IP enforcement, and uh, uh, the, the, the solution coming from the EU directive on trade secret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. It, it, if, if uh, uh, choice of law is always an issue when drafting a contract uh, and the problem solving solutions ADR or courts in, in uh, trade secrets uh, is a must. I mean, it, there are big differences between the, the different uh, members of the European Union so that in contractual relationships, it, it, it's, uh, it's an issue to be taken into account. There's something that, um, that uh, we, we talked about and maybe we can, we can talk uh, once again uh, it's, it's the difference between uh, the European Union and uh, e the US regarding uh, the, what we call the infringing goods, something that surprised you, I, I, I believe, because of the conversations we had before, Sharon, has surprised you a little bit and it creates some, maybe some concerns to the uh, US uh, companies, to the US uh, 
actors in the, this global environment because it's true that we have a, something that is called infringing goods and uh, it's a sort of sin that follows the product no matter where, where they are and uh, can cause problems. This combined with the, uh, and maybe maybe Nicola can tell us a little bit more about this kind of a, uh, strict liability uh, that is based on, on the Article 4.4 of the, of the directive. The, 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 the question of you, you knew or ought under the circumstances to have known, something that has created some, also some noise and, 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 and concerns within the community, at least in, in Europe. So any, yeah. of, any of you can start. Yeah, I, I please, Sharon. Yeah, I like to think about, um, you know, and teach my students about, so, so one of the things is there's this debate about whether trade secrets is unfair competition or property, and it's both because you have to have this thing called the trade secret uh, and meet the definition, this information. And then you have to have an act uh, of misappropriation, which is unfair competition. And so traditionally the acts of unfair competition at common law were wrong, what I call wrongful disclosure and wrongful use. That uh, law morphed into including what is now known as wrongful acquisition. So you always see these laws set up as saying, acquisition, disclosure, and use. And in the United States, the acquisi wrongful acquisition, disclosure, and use has to be with the requisite uh, state of mind, which is at least uh, knowledge and reason to know. Now, the way the U EU Trade Secret Directive, it brings that in in the remedies provision, but in Article um, 4 itself, it, it seems kind of, not all the wrongs have that knowledge component right in the definition of the wrongdoing. And then the thing that the EU Trade Secret Directive did, which I think is problematic and really wasn't thought through, is it added what I call a new wrong, which is, uh, you know, uh, the production offering or placing on the market the in of infringing goods, which is Article 4, 5. And the problem I have with that is because it's based on knowledge or reason to know, it's it's at least theoretically possible that some retailer selling some good with that has a misappropriated trade secret in it can be notified and then all of a sudden be liable for trade secret misappropriation because they're selling that good. And I don't think that's what was intended and it's not a cause of action in the United States. So I think it's a real problem. Nicolas, I think it also creates some some concerns in Europe. This oh, issue of the I'm not sure that there is uh, concern in Europe on that point because we are using the the, the word older inside the, the directive, but it is a, a not precise qualification in front of our uh, civil tradition. I, I mentioned the the, the BGB tradition or. Uh, the French civil code tradition, and in front of the French law, it's possible to say that if I am older, I am owner. So it means I can say that I am the owner of the trade secret, and if, in case of uh, infringement, I can use the uh, solution of the civil law for goods to protect my, my ownership. And if it is not possible to say that, I have to use, of course, unfair competition, like it is the case in Germany. So we don't have exactly the, the same uh, the same qualification. I'm not sure that at the end of the day there is a lot of differences because uh, the harmonization of the civil proceeding may help to follow the same solution. So even for uh, an unfair competition position or an ownership qualification, uh, we have to follow more or less the same procedure because we have an harmonization of uh, the civil procedure by the the directive with a kind of copy of uh, of the uh, IP solution for infringement. So if we copy the IP law solution, it means that we are close to the ownership maybe, but it's not clearly sure. And for the um, for the unlawful uh, acts, we have a, a, a specific definition, as mentioned uh, uh, Javier in, in the directive. And the, 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 I think one of the most difficult points for the EU area is the combination between the definition of the lawful and the definition of the unlawful act, because the two uh, approach 
is following by uh, the directive, but it's not exactly the same definition, what it is lawful and what it is unlawful. So we may imagine that sometime you are in the middle between yeah. lawful and unlawful. And of course, it will be difficult in front of the course to, to say what is lawful and what is unlawful. And in front of the uh, unlawful acts, we have uh, the, the last point of the definition, which is very close from the unfair competition because we mentioned honest practice, un, honest co commercial practice. It is close to the definition of the trips, of course, and close to the definition of the Article 10 bis of the uh, Paris Convention and back to the unfair practices and unfair competition solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems that we we still need to 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 work a little bit on harmonization, both at uh, European level, maybe at the U.S. level, a little bit less. Uh, but what about uh, uh, the other countries? Because we haven't talked about uh, uh, Asia countries such as China, Japan. They have also moved uh, towards uh, a solution that is based on 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 uh, solutions uh, raised by by the U.S. or, or basically U.S. but also sometimes uh, Europe. You know, uh, can you give us some some ideas about how is the situation in, uh, for instance, China, Japan? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that the the fall, the, what happened after the TRIPS agreement and, and the U.S. use of free trade agreements to try to ratchet up IP uh, protection in different countries is applicable to trade secrets. You know, we saw that in the so-called new NAFTA you know, one of the provisions that was changed was the trade secret provision in the original NAFTA agreement. And, and but a lot of what the focus is on those free trade agreements is on requiring countries to provide for criminal penalties for trade secret uh, misappropriation. And then what's happening, I think, in China and Japan and uh, and, and, and to some extent uh, criticism of Canada and laughing because you know, Canada was ranked the, the second best trade secret uh, protective com country under the uh, pursuant to the OECD report or, or um, index. Um, but US, the US uh, TRs is really pushing for Canada to adopt a federal uh, trade secret law in Canada that would be applicable to the whole country um, as opposed to having to know the law of each province. Um, in Japan, the recent changes uh, have focused on the reasonable efforts requirement and trying, I think, to make it more um, flexible um, and less based on a point system. And then in China, I think, uh, you know, it's just an ongoing effort to um, uh, increase enforcement, to have the Chinese authority increase enforcement of their of trade secret principles in China. Mm -hmm. I think this point is really important because in front of the uh, in front of the definition or in front of the regime of trade secret, we have a very practical aspect which has which must be taken into account. Uh, 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 trade secret is not something just for academic. It is included in many, many TTA. And when you have an international effect in TTA, you will have also some tax question. And if we have an harmonization in front of the uh, definition or notion of trade secret, maybe it will help also uh, businesses to have a clear uh, uh, tax analysis of the TTA and to be able to uh, qualify the, 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 the income based on trade secret. If we have differences in qualification, we may imagine that part of the contract can be qualify in front of a national tax law as trade secret or as good and maybe have some tax uh, uh, um, uh, tax advantage and for another uh, national law we may have another qualification and must be applied another legal solution and I think for businesses the question is just a question of qualification, which is more uh, an academic uh, question than a question of implementation of uh, transfer of technology and uh, joint venture and partnership. And in front of that, uh, the, all the difficulty we can see in Europe, in US and more globally uh, uh, needs some uh, needs some answer, I think. Yeah, you're right. Tax is always an issue and uh, it is in, in this field as well. 
Uh, in, in practice, uh, there are many occasions in which uh, trade secrets are the, the most important uh, uh, package in a, in a transaction. So from a practical point of view, yes, something to be taken into, into account. So it means uh, to conclude with this this uh, this issue, I feel that we, we will need something to be more harmonized. Uh, uh, do you think, uh, Nicolas, that, that, that it will be necessary to have a, a, a directive number two or even a regulation in Europe in order to fully harmonize the, the regime in, in Europe? That will be a first step in, in in our house. I think we need a, a, a EU IP, so it is my first uh, <laughs> idea, and I think we need also a, a solution for, for, for trade secret. But the, the, the point here is that, back to my first uh, answer, is the connection between fact and law. So it's really difficult to have a regulation on trade secret without any answer on what is a good, what is uh, uh, the, 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 the civil tort regime. So we need a global civil harmonization and I think it is not on the table actually. So we may be, uh, have something better than the actual solution, but I think according to our uh, level of harmonization for the civil law and commercial law actually in Europe, it will not possible to have a real uh, harmonized answer. Uh, but I'm sure that we need some that in, in maybe, uh, I don't know, 10 years, 10 years, uh, so more longer, but <laughs> more we will be integrated in front of the law, stronger we will be for the international business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, I, in this, I, you know, I think that I, I really admire, and a lot of people admire the EU, for instance, for uh, adopting the GDPR. And a lot of people are looking with interest at the new data proposal. But the problem is, is I don't see a lot of coordination between those different proposals. And when you think about it, a business doesn't get information in nice little buckets. You know, this is the trade secret bucket. This is the privacy bucket. This is the data bucket. They just get a mass of information. And so what's happening is all these laws and principles are being developed that impact information. But nobody's looking how the, at, at how they intersect and how how and that needs to happen more. Um, and um, I, I see that as the future of what we do, maybe at the policy level. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think Sharon, as you said, uh, the, we we have small pocket or small box because it's too difficult for us to be able to have an answer for a big box. So it's easier to have small point which can be harmonized and to try to have a, a global answer. But at, at the end of the day, we don't have an answer because the small box is something inside a, a, a big volume of data or big volume of uh, business uh, uh, secret. Uh, and, and it is a, a difficulty for us, but I think it is a, a real challenge for all of us. And this uh, uh, multi-qualification of an information can be uh, 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 can be a question in front of, uh, of a court at least. Because we may say that, in my opinion, the qualification is trade secret. And for another one, the qualification can be a personal data. So if the two regulations cannot be combined, we have, uh, of course, a difficulty. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are, it's uh, uh, 5 uh, 16, so we have uh, just some, uh, a few minutes to, to discuss because the audience is uh, raising questions. I'm uh, following the, the QA. And, a uh, And so just, just uh, some, uh, I say that, that, that there are some, some concerns, discussions, and dilemmas. Some, some of them have been already discussed, uh, such as the one we mentioned before what is uh, trade secret, what is confidential information, etc. But something that uh, concerns, sometimes, uh, at least in, in Europe, is the possibility of uh, US courts uh, of having jurisdiction over European uh, European uh, companies in trade secret issues, uh, sort of long arm jurisdiction uh, that would be uh, very important, let's say, in, in the current situation when uh, almost all transactions are, are digital and it's difficult to know where the, the action took place, etc., etc. So, What's your, your opinion, Sean, on, on this? Well, that issue was, with respect to the DTSA, that was issue was front and center for why the Defend Trade Secret Act should be adopted. The existing uh, Economic Espionage Act of 1996, which was the criminal, the federal criminal law, 
yes. has a extraterritorial provision which was uh, basically made a part of the DTSA. It wasn't really amended, but there's really not that much jurisprudence on on that. And I don't I don't personally think um, it extends as far as some uh, people think. Um, so it needs it needs further development. Um, and of course, the problem is, is even if you could, for instance, if you're an American company, could sue a foreign company in the U.S., you would still have to enforce that uh, in the country. And so that's an issue that is not addressed uh, at all. And the enforcement piece of any sort of U.S. judgment is not addressed at all in the DTSA. And and you know, as you know, we generally don't want you haven't uh, joined the enforcement treaties. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what so, is happening? What is happening is there is uh, it is arising uh, at the International Trade Commission when goods are sought to be uh, imported into the United States, and the United States being a big um, uh, market for a lot of companies, that's that's where this is arising more. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we have discussed about the issue of uh, of uh, um, trade secrets as uh, as IP rights, and furthermore, to, uh, the, the subject of, of property. I don't think we have to to insist on this. Let's uh, finalize our, our chat with uh, some uh, considerations about the future, uh, because uh, in the current situation of the data economy industry 4.0. What I've read, what I've seen is that uh, uh, the, 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 the trade secret will have a, an important uh, and relevant role on it. Uh, what is your, your opinion about these? Which are the, the issues you, you foresee for the future in trade secrets uh, in relationship in relation with the, with the data, ownership of data, trade on data, etc. And the algorithms as well. Yes, that, that's the main point, I think, because in front of the new tech, we have uh, artificial intelligence and mainly each element of the artificial intelligence is owned through the secret because we can see here a limit of the patent law or maybe the copyright law is not possible to be owner of an algorithm through the, the, the patent law and the secret is better because you can control the, the, your mathematical model by this way as strong as you want and 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 the, the maybe you may have some right on the databases which is used to uh, uh, to learn uh, with the artificial intelligence but for the big data we don't have any specific uh, tool with the uh, intellectual property and maybe the only way to uh, control or to manage this uh, big uh, movement of data is the the, the trade secret so uh, uh, quicker is the economy, more the, question, more the trade secret is really interesting and important because it's the best way and the simplest way to, to have a, 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 a competitive advantage on the market in front of the competitors. Mm -hmm. Sharon, any opinion well, on this? Two, two quick points. First of all, it's important yeah. to realize that not all information and data is are trade secrets, so they, they, you can, they can't be equated. And second of all, I think from a policy point of view, we really have to think seriously about how we facilitate the sharing of at least raw data, you know, because I think it's inefficient to have a bunch of companies going around and collecting the same information uh, to fuel their AI or whatever else they're doing. Um, that's just inefficient. And so I think we need to have more sharing of da data um, and trade secret law might be able to help with that, but that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Shall we think that sometime or uh, in the future, uh, data can build essential infrastructure and say that we have to open the, the, the data to any competitors in the market because it is a kind of essential infrastructure that it is done in uh, competition law for many uh, structural or incorporate infrastructure? Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of it, a lot of data is collected from public sources, like um, in in my city, the county board of real uh, of property rights, you know, um, and uh, and also it's collected from consumers. So I have a real problem with, um, you know, extending trade secret rights to information that was is basically owned by other people, but was just collected by the, you know, purported trade secret owner. 
for the EU, we have a EU directive on uh, on state information and data collected by state and uh, local uh, organization. It is mainly uh, open data, but for uh, commercial and businesses, uh, I think it can be a, a, a point of reflection that we requalify the, the the data as essential infrastructure. And as you mentioned, just the, 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 the raw data can be used like that and the business will invest to change raw data as something which can be used in the in the in the new economy mm -hmm. it is yeah. the idea i think of the uh, eu commission for uh, eu uh, data market yeah i think so i mean it's uh, it's about sharing data and uh, as, as much as possible uh, among uh, private parties and uh, respect to uh, privacy, respect to competition law and respect to consumers. So who knows what the future will drive us, uh, but it seems that it will drive us to a situation where we, you can share the data and we, it will be an asset, a real asset, I mean, in, in transactions and, and so on and so forth. So uh, seven minutes to the end, uh, you know, we, we fully respect the times here. So I would like to uh, raise some of the issues uh, of the audience. Uh, this, uh, Nicola uh, say something I will try to, to tell you what has led some states to prohibit NCCs the UK has just announced the intention to curb the use of NCCs in the interest of supporting startups Silicon Valley being the ideal I'm curious as to where this might lead I have no idea what the, the UK said. Sorry, it's far from. I, I have no element which can help you to analyze this, this this case. Maybe Javier, you have heard about that point, or you don't have more no. information. So I'm really sorry. It is the limit of my trade secret or something like that. So if I don't have knowledge, I cannot have something secret. I, it's not possible to to share with you my knowledge. Okay. So, uh, Nicola, we'll try to answer you in writing, okay? We, we need to study a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, another one says, uh, will trade secrets marketing authorization limit access to COVID vaccines? Should courts reconsider decisions like Ruckel House versus Monsanto USSC because of the pandemic? I guess I should answer that because it involves a US case. First of all, um, you know, that case is, in my opinion, often mischaracterized and misread. Um, it did say that um, trade secrets are property for the purpose of a taking under uh, the US Constitution. But it also said that uh, that's because the way the government regulation was written, a promise was made to the provider of the information, what the court called an investment backed um, uh, expectation. And so the important thing to know about that case and that I believe in strongly with regard to COVID or any other important innovations is governments have a right to say, thou shall disclose this. Um, and, you know, and, and, and not have there be a taking under US law, certainly. But also um, it's important to realize that for regulatory purposes, it's possible and it happens every day for governments to ask for the disclosure of information, even trade secrets, that doesn't result in the loss of trade secrets. Um, certainly in the US, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been advocating for is that with respect to federally funded research, which a lot of the COVID vaccines in the US, I mean, being developed now, were, were funded in large part by the US, um, the government should be able to um, demand ownership and or access to or uh, ability to license uh, not only any patented invention but also trade secret. Mm -hmm. I, I think this question is cl a, a classic problem with the trade secret because we put everything in the same bag but at the end of the day it cannot be the same so we have to distinguish drug development and maybe trade secret of each laboratory which develop uh, a vaccine for the COVID and I think there is no more question on that point because it is done. We have two, three, four, five uh, uh, medical solutions. So, uh, and we never say that uh, uh, Pfizer and another company must 
uh, open the trade secret for uh, drug development. The second point is the production of the vaccine and the production of the vaccine is not the same problem as the development of the vaccine. And I don't know if there will be problem with trade secret for the production, but I don't think it is clear that they will have many suppliers who Uh, which will produce the, the, the vaccine, it means that it's more or less easy when you have the, the receipt of the vaccine, it's more or less easy to produce the vaccine. So it means maybe you have some, some uh, technical issue, but mainly it's common uh, to, to produce when you are a good professional such, such a vaccine. And I don't think there will be a trade secret issue at that point. And the last but not the least is the distribution of the vaccine. And for that point, I don't think there is any issue in front of trade secret. So it's easy to say, ah, maybe you will have problem with IP and vaccine and then with trade secret and vaccine. But now we know that we have developed vaccine. We will be able to produce vaccine. And I don't see any trouble or real trouble with IP, except if we, if we want to contest IP. And that mm -hmm. uh, was a, a good issue. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And sometimes it's time to market is one of the issues for the for the for the trade secrets. I mean, it, it makes a difference so that it would be relevant. Uh, and uh, Gabriel says, uh, ask, is asking us, uh, what is the direction, if any, of uh, trade secret re regulations in the European Union and US free trade agreements on similar agreements? What are we what are we moving? Nowhere. I think I think in the U.S. it remains to be seen, right? Because we have a new administration, and um, we we have to wait to see who the new um, trade representative is and what policies they decide to uh, pursue. I think in the EU level, we try to protect trade secret inside our. Uh, Uh, commercial agreements, so it's always the same question, high level of IP protection, including uh, the protection of trade secrets in front of the recent uh, agreement. It is uh, something which is in line with the trips and maybe a little bit, but I think it's something which is classical nowadays. Uh, uh, we, we, we want to be sure to protect the, the trade secret. And uh, I think one of the points here is the gap between Uh, a state uh, which uh, have uh, international agreement between another state and private company uh, which have a, a, a trade secret and want to trade with another uh, private company. And the, the level of negotiation and qualification is clearly different. And sometimes you have difficulty between the, the, the uh, state declaration, for example, to open trade secret and how Uh, businesses are acting on the market and, and this point can be a problem, but in front of the negotiation and, uh, uh, and the international uh, business agreement, I think there is not a lot of issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vincent is asking why is taking so long in uh, harmonizing uh, trade secrets while uh, patents uh, uh, back from uh, uh, patent harmonization back from uh, Uh, some many, many years ago. I'm not so sure we are fully harmonized in the patent field, but any in any event. <laughs> well, I mean, the quick answer to that is there was a lot of resistance to even adding Article 39 to, to the um, TRIPS agreement. Um, and what happened is first there was a fight about whether or not um, IP should be included in a trade agreement, but then there was a fight about whether trade secrets were IP. And what happened in, during those negotiations, in my opinion, is there wasn't much uh, discussion of the niceties of trade secret law and the boundaries and limitations of it. It was just kind of a last minute, you know, throw it into the Article 39 and see what happens. And so, this, so with that in mind, I think that international conversation of trade secrets just started, you know, 26 years ago <laughs> or 20 seven years ago. So it's it's a short it's a much shorter history compared to uh, patents, trademarks and copyright. And and we can have another explanation is that trade secret is fact and in front of fact we can have a strong position and maybe 
even for businesses, we are not sure that we want to have a legal qualification or legal regime or something which is only a, a factual position. For example, we can have a, a technological solution which can be patentable, but we prefer to have it in, with, uh, to control it through uh, a trade secret or secret know-how because it looks stronger. We don't have to uh, disclose the knowledge. And for many businesses, and I think for many academics, the, 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 the fact may be better and stronger than any legal qualification because when we start with legal qualification, of course, we have to interpret the, the, the qualification, we have to identify the limit of the qualification, and it is our uh, today conversation. So if we, uh, without any EU or US regulation, we remain in a factual position and maybe it's easier, but we need some legal answer. We mentioned for TTA, for tax reason, to be able to protect or to sue in front of the judge. Uh, we have problem with criminal law, which is not harmonized even in the EU area. So there is a lot of things which are not harmonized yet, and, and maybe it is because facts are strong. Okay, two two last questions. Uh, Manuel, I promise that we that those are the two the two last, okay? Uh, uh, one, uh, one hand, uh, sorry, uh, Sonke ask, is asking us uh, on uh, something that's not working properly. Just a second. Okay, do you think that at some instance non-personal data controllers, as far as data could be considered trade secrets, may be obliged to give access to the non-personal data controlled by them, if yes, under which circumstances? One way or another we have a little answer uh, uh, this this question, but if you want to add anything, uh, that would be perfect. This is an important question because, um, and this goes back to what I said about not considering all, you know, the fact that companies get a, a mass of information with different legal requirements. And part of the problem is I don't think the data controllers are being educated about what the obligations are. As a, <laughs> as a technical um, matter, you know, it's, if they weren't, if they're not under an obligation to keep the information confidential and they and, and I would argue that they know it's a trade secret, then they can share it. Um, of course, the trade secret owners would protest that, but the whole idea of the reasonable efforts requirement of trade secret law is to make sure that the person who you would hold uh, to be obligated to keep the trade secrets, knows that they're obligated to keep the trade secrets, and also knows what information is, is at least claimed to be a trade secret. And without that, you know, and that's why the reasonable efforts requirement is such an important feature of trade secret law. And I think this is particularly important in countries like the United States that have criminal trade secret uh, provisions. You know, I don't want, I tell my students, do you want to get thrown in jail, in federal <laughs> prison, and you didn't never knew you had an obligation to keep the information as a trade secret. And I think the answer to that is no. So. Yes, I think one thing which can be learned from the RGPD is the uh, identification of the information. And through this, we have to identify personal uh, data and it is important to be able to apply the, 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 the legal solution. And I think one of the main issues for businesses is to be able to identify a trade secret or secret know-how and then be able to put in action all the, 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 the legal solution. And we know that uh, if we have a trade secret, we must be able to control the trade secret and to show that we have done enough to control the trade secret. But we need firstly to identify the trade secret and maybe one of the main issue is the identification. Then you know do I, you have the asset and you will be able to manage the asset inside the, 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 the company uh, management and company strategy. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And last and very interesting uh, question from Giacomo. He says, uh, following one of our of your previous answer, given the difficulties currently encountered in protecting inventions related to artificial intelligence systems, both because of possible lack of invent inventorship and or because of issues related to the sufficiency of, of our disclosure, could trade secrets provide a valid alternative and even, in a way, enter into competition with the patent system? 
I think it's, oh, go ahead. No, you Sharon, go ahead. Please. Yes, okay. and the, the competition between trade secret and patent is the history of the patent law. We always have trade secret, then we create patent law, but patent law is always in competition with trade secret. More or less, if it is possible to remain uh, honored to be the holder of the information, trade secret is better than the, the patent because we don't have to disclose. So there is no question of competition between something which is like that for, for all, if it is patentable, and it is not always the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'll add in the United States, um, there's a very famous case called Kiwani, which basically says that trade secret law is not preempted by federal patent law, which means that the, both patent protection and trade secret protection can coexist in theory. But the important thing about that case is that the reason why the US Supreme Court said that it's because trade secret protection is limited. And so if we don't limit in the United States, if we don't limit trade secret in the same way or in Europe it, 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 or in anywhere else, it then conflicts with patent policy. And that is a very serious concern for any country to get that balance right. Um, we don't want people deciding to not to forego patent protection and the disclosure that's involved in favor of trade secrecy, um, and that's uh, an important policy point. Mm -hmm. This could be maybe an issue for the following session. We will have uh, probably next year about uh, artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, economy of data and trade secrets. So we have to conclude because we are nine minutes ahead and uh, probably uh, Manolo and Laurent will tell me that I'm a, I'm a naughty boy because I'm not controlling this, this situation, but it, it has been so, so interesting so that I enjoyed a lot and I thank you very much to you both for your contributions to your bright <laughs> ideas and uh, all your thoughts. Thank you very much. And Manolo is here to con for the conclusion. Thank you, Manolo. Thank you. Thanks very much, Javier. It has been in, indeed a, a great and live discussion. Unbelievable. Yeah. So the, I have the feeling I have the feeling that this has been a discussion full of very, very valuable reflections. And uh, and I am certainly uh, I have the, the need, let's say, certainly to, to review the recording in order to learn more. Yeah. So thanks uh, to our speakers. Yeah, thanks to Professor Sanden and to Professor Bingtin, uh, Bang Tang. Uh, congratulations to our dear friend Javier Fernandez Laschetti, who have conducted magnificently these encounters. But uh, above all, I'd like to thank to all of you who are connected today. Uh, in fact, you are the protagonists of this growing encounters community. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to highlight the presence of the students from Bocconi University uh, and thank also very especially to our encounter support group. You know, this group uh, is hidden uh, in the shadows, but is extremely active preparing the references and preparing the report of all the encounters. Yeah. So if any of you would like to join the encounter support group, please let us know yeah, and uh, we will enter immediately into contact with you. Yeah. So, well, Laurent, this has been the seventh and the last encounter of this year. So let me briefly recollect a little bit what has been our life. We started in May with a general overview uh, headed uh, by Professor Jane Ginsburg from the United States. Uh, Professor Anselm Kamperman Sanders from the Netherlands, Professor Laurent Mandelieu from France, and, and in this occasion I had the pleasure to moderate it. Yeah. Then, then we moved uh, still in May, and, and I guess I will not forget anyone, but we moved still in May to discuss in our second encounters questions related to trade, IP and investment. There, we enjoyed the director of the IP division of the World Trade Organization, Anthony, Anthony Chaupman, from Australia, if I recall well. Yeah. Uh, we enjoyed also Professor Claudio Dordi from Italy and Professor Isol Gendru from Canada. Yeah. Uh, all of them were moderated by Professor Xavier Seuba from Spain. 
by the way, uh, Xavier, some days later, just some days later, joined the European Patent Office as director of its academy. Then June offered us a third encounter. This time, if you recall well, was an international IP and access to uh, to the pandemic treatments. Yeah? Very, very up to date. Yeah? There, under the leadership of Professor Laurent Mandelieu, from France, yeah. <laughs> we had the opportunity to enjoy the views of Professor Rochelle Dreyfus uh, from the United States, and uh, and also Professor Henning Roser Rusekan yeah, from from Germany, yeah, now living in Cambridge. Yeah. Then in July, uh, I recall well that we had our fourth encounter. This brought us to other fascinating topics, yeah, IP and arbitration. Yeah. Uh, then uh, uh, the moderator was Ignacio de Castro from WIPO and uh, the, the, the speakers were Professor Catherine Rogers from the United States and Professor Xun Yang Lang from, from Singapore. Yeah. Then the break of summer and uh, September, we came back and we introduced our fifth encounter. Yeah. This time was on artificial intelligence, software and patents. Yeah. And there we enjoyed Professor Noam Shenton from the UK, Professor Shan Yu from China, yeah, and all the, he, they both were moderated by our friend uh, Dr. Marco Aleman, the director of the patent division of uh, WIPO. And the sixth encounter took place in October. This brought us to the world of trademarks, yeah, and uh, Professor Alberto Casado from Spain. Uh, moderated a splendid team uh, where if I recall well was Professor Irene uh, Calboli from the US, uh, Professor Xu Qin Lin from China and then Professor Alexander von Mullendal from Germany. And this brought us to our last encounter of this year where we have been uh, enjoying uh, Professor Sharon Sanden from the United States and Professor Nicolas Vantin from France, yeah, both moderated by our friend uh, Javier Fernandez Laschetti, our coordinator. So uh, all in all, I guess this is a quite a, a beautiful encounters college. Yeah. Each encounter, you know, I have the feeling that each encounter is a world by itself, yeah, but all together form a splendid source of knowledge. Hundred and hundred of interested persons follow these encounters on, on the spot. But I, I can tell you that many more uh, later on study them uh, watching the recordings of all the different encounters, reading the references, reading the reports, uh, going back to the question and answers, uh, developing then discussions in their own regions. Yeah? So we do believe that this is a very, very valuable legacy for the future. But this is not the end. Next year, we're going to organize at least 10, 12 encounters on different topics, but always with the same spirit. So uh, uh, trying to offer all those interested in intellectual property all over the world, valuable tools and reflections on how intellectual property could develop in the 21st century in order to share better this uh, society, which is new, and which becomes more and more, more complex, yeah. Uh, it is my pleasure, by the way, to announce that we will start reviewing next January how the area of copyright, I think we were going to forget copyright, yeah, how the area of copyright is rapidly moving to face this virtual and cognitive uh, already coming era. So let me close this encounter by thanking very warmly my very good friend Laurent Mandelieu. He is the, not only the co-director of the Global Digital Encounters. Laurent, you are the person who conceived the concept. You are the person who brought it into life and you are the person who leader its development. So honor to you. And uh, I would like also to finish by thanking our Alvaro Arribas. I mean, without you, Alvaro, we would be lost. <laughs> So thanks to you, we have been able to, to go smoothly and incredibly smoothly uh, through all these encounters. Uh, and of course, thanks also to FIDE and thanks to TIPSA, our founding organizations for believing from the very beginning in our encounters. So Merry Christmas to everyone.
enjoy these days, please, and come back on January. Do count Congratulations. for our next encounter. See you then and you very uh, much. see you in January. And thanks very much to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for thank including you, me. And thank congratulations. You, bye bye. Okay. Thank very you very bye. much. Bye. bye bye. Bye. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you all over the world. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.